radar application, application of remote sensing in the ocean and urban areas, GIS applications for water and land resource management, numerical modeling of peat, water quality monitoring, etc. He is an expert member on the Committee for Geospatial Technology in the Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce. He has several presentations and publications at the national and international levels. He is a member of several reputed professional societies, including the International Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing and the Indian Society for Remote Sensing. I also extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Arun Kumar Nandagopal. He completed his post graduation in Spatial Information Technology from the University of Madras and also a Business Management Certificate from XLRI Jamshedpur. He is currently working as a JS App Developer in the Center for Spatial Analytics and Advanced JS IASC Bengaluru. He has more than 17 years of industry experience in satellite remote sense, satellite image processing, data analytics, and JAS applications in several fields. Once again, and welcome on and all, and wish you all an engaging and enriching session ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Nakshi. Uh, among us, uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Dipankar, uh, Sukumar sir, uh, many eminent uh, uh, scholars, all of them have joined us. So welcome you all again. And now I hand, hand over the session to Dr. Y. Nityanandan. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Jyoti, and thank you, Dr. Minakshi, for the introduction. And uh, uh, I'm sharing my screen right now. So, uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, today the topic is on uh, current trends and prospects in remote sensing and uh, uh, I'd like to begin with an uh, yeah begin with a broad outline of this presentation uh, first I'm going to talk about uh, geospatial technology in a slide or two just because to give an overview of how remote sensing technology has evolved and uh, what are the uh, from where it has organized and so on and thereafter, I would like to talk about uh, uh, the developments in remote sensing technology and its platforms uh, in which we can able to um, uh, see different technologies that has evolved and also different platforms that we have uh, uh, in remote sensing. And thereafter, uh, we'll be looking at uh, the data sets that, uh, that, that are remotely acquired and also some of the softwares that we can uh, use for it. And at the end, I would like to uh, complete it with the prospects for students in academia and in industry. Uh, I think my bandwidth is little low. I'm turning off my video. Uh, please pardon me. I'll continue with my presentation. So the geospatial technology, as many of you is aware, uh, it's a field that includes GIS, remote sensing, and global navigation satellite system. And uh, the geospatial technology helps us to acquire data uh, from the earth and also it helps us to analyze it, model it, uh, and we can simulate it and visualize the output as well. And this technology allows us to make informed decisions based on the importance and priority of resources. Uh, this technology broadly contains the three major disciplines, GIS, remote sensing, and GNSS. Uh, the GNSS earlier we used to call it as uh, GPS and uh, it has been renamed as Global Navigation Satellite System which includes GPS as one of the system. And uh, just to give an overview of other two technologies uh, that I'm not going to cover, uh, today is one is GIS. Uh, you might have discussed earlier uh, in the earlier presentations that uh, it's a computer-based system that can uh, uh, able to take the data, process it, and provide uh, output in a sp uh, spatial information in a form that user requires. And we also have global navigation satellite system, which uh, in, for this has been used uh, widely with our own uh, mobile phones. And these days, uh, almost all the applications in our mobile phones are tied up with uh, the satellite systems, which is a constellation of satellite uh, provide signals, which enables us to find accurate position, timing, and uh, also the uh, also the height and uh, the important point that i'm going to cover today is on remote sensing as you all aware it's a science of obtaining information about an object 
or an area from a distance, typically from a satellite. Uh, this was like, we all have a remote sensing sensor with us, which uh, we are all equipped and we all born with a remote sensing sensor, especially uh, with our eyes is considered as one of the first remote sensing sensor. And uh, based on that, we have this development, uh, the remote sensing sensors have developed over a period of time. And the development are listed here. The important breakthrough in this development is, uh, uh, was happened in 1800 when uh, so William Herschel has discovered this infrared imagery. So based on that, the development in photography has happened and the imaging techniques has improved. Imaging platforms has developed over a period of time. We started uh, with pigeons, we started with balloons, we started with rockets, and then uh, we today mostly depends uh, either uh, uh, the space-based technology or the, the lowest ground-based technology, ba basically uh, utilizing UAVs and other uh, low uh, altitude systems. So the imp I have highlighted some of the important breakthroughs here, which happened in uh, 1914 and uh, between 1914 and 18, where we have used aerial photography for reconnaissance. So in that period, that was the first period time we have used something as a photography, uh, which has been observed from a space or from an uh, air, so that we can able to look at enemy's uh, territory, what is happening and all over this. Another important breakthrough happened in 839-45 during Second World War. Uh, this is like uh, we, uh, it was a challenge for people to see through night. And uh, that was a breakthrough which helps them to see uh, um, the, uh, things happening in enemy territory during night with the help of uh, thermal infrared remote sensing. And after 1972 is an important year because that time we had uh, our uh, Landsat series. And Landsat is a series in which uh, um, we get continuous satellite systems. And this has been widely utilized by researchers across the globe. And uh, more importantly, it is something available for free for us to utilize. So after Landsat, there are many satellite systems which are developed for land observation uh, and for many other applications. And uh, the breakthroughs has been, I mean, the important development that happened over a period in 80s, we had hyperspectral sensors and then LIDARs in 90s. And then we have in early 2000 and today we have too many sensors and uh, the technology is moving towards where uh, we can able to combine more than one technology and we can, uh, we are trying to improve the capability of sensing and we are also trying to uh, enhance the processing speed and it's, um, uh, accuracy as well. So the physics behind, when we talk about remote sensing, we, it is necessary to understand the physics behind it. The physics behind remote sensing, uh, the remote sensing is mainly depend on electromagnetic wave, which is a component of electric and magnetic waves, which are perpendicular to uh, each other, an oriented um, in an uh, axis. So if you look at this, the electromagnetic spectrum on your left, that uh, in which the 400 to 700 nanometer is something we are looking at uh, uh, even in uh, visible spectrum. And uh, beyond this, before 400 nanometers and after 700 nanometers, it is not visible to, uh, to us and we are unable to see this. So there are ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays, and we have infrared, microwave, and uh, other waves uh, in the other side of the spectrum. So earlier when the remote sensing has started, at that time we used to uh, utilize this uh, electromagnetic spectrum, especially between 400 to 700 nanometers, because uh, that was quite popular. And uh, after we have started utilizing infrared, and now we have started utilizing ultraviolet also. So the system of remote sensing can be broadly classified into two ways. One is uh, active, another one is a passive system. Um, to make it very simple, uh, I can even compare this active and passive system with uh, our mobile phone cameras. Let's assume uh, when we are clicking a picture without a flash, I would say it is can be correlated with your uh, passive system because we are not providing any light to an object and an object was naturally illuminated uh, from an alternate source. Uh, in general, it is from uh, the sunlight. And then we are able to capture the light which is reflected from that and the brightness values which are received in the sensor are further translated as an image. This is a kind of passive system 
where we does not provide any energy from the sensor uh, or the source so it comes from an alternate source whereas in case of active system it is something like you can compare it with a flash at times at night you provide a system uh, you provide the energy and the object get illuminated and then you are capturing it but in real world we cannot take this in remote sensing especially space borne remote sensing or aerial remote sensing we cannot take this flash as an uh, example straight away because that use a complete different system a passive system is almost similar to what i have given as an example because it takes an energy when a satellite or any other sensor the satellite if the sensor is kept in satellite or even if a sensor is kept in aeroplane that uh, takes an energy during day in passive system it just capture images based on whatever illumination the object received from the other source whereas in active system it is not going to send energy it the energy i mean in the form of light but it sends energy in the form of radio waves and coherent light waves which we cannot see also so the i'll touch the passive system first because that is the most common and widely popular system and it has few categorizes when is uh, the panchromatic imaging we have uh, panchromatic bands generally in in a bundle of satellite images we have something called panchromatic band the the band itself is an is a black and white image of a uh, single channel the importance of this band compared to any other band in the bunch is uh, because it has a broad band when i say about broad band let's say uh, if you are in an electromagnetic spectrum if you have 400 to 700 nanometer let's say if you in general cases you have 450 to 4 475 nanometers the the dif, the discrimination between uh, the bands and the the length of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum is very little in narrow bands whereas in case of broad band that has been a little extended where the the nanometer is bigger so where you can say the um, it covers a larger portion of electromagnetic spectrum compared to the multispectral images where multispectral images again uh, it has more than one narrow bands so that we can able to form composites and uh, the the most popular system of that uh, the recent one is landsat oli where we, it's a multispectral system where it has more than one bands and each of that when you look at electromag when you look at this uh, um, satellite images each of that would be in black and white but when you combine it we may able to form a composite and multispectral channel helps us to get that and there is something called superspectral imaging that is a terminology which has been used for uh, the sensors which provides bands which are greater than 10 and uh, the the commonly used uh, the commonly pointed system for that is modis uh, which has more than 10 bands in this uh, um, output and then we have hyperspectral system a hyperspectral system is very uh, interesting because uh, it is not like a multispectral system it covers a smaller area relatively smaller area compared to a multispectral system and uh, this has a contiguous spectral bands it has hundreds of bands and this bands are of very narrow wavelength well, the reason for having very narrow wavelength is each of the objects on the earth has its own spectral characteristics so if you are interested in studying a particular object let's say if i am interested in studying granites or if i am interested in studying a particular uh, uh, what do you call for a species then i require a particular spectral characteristics to be studied let's say i need to study between 472 to 75 nanometers specifically for that purpose we require a narrow band which has a very small uh, bandwidth for that hyperspectral imaging would be helpful but it do comes with a, a challenge because multispectral multispectral or uh, it's not too narrow compared to hyperspectral but multispectral covers certain portion of electromagnetic spectrum only so that we can avoid an area where it is uh, um, where it is in, in you know affected by the atmosphere and so on whereas in case of hyperspectral it's kind of grating and we need to continue uh acquiring every uh, you know subsequent electromagnetic spectrum let's say it start from 400 to 700 and it is an incremental of 10 
then you need to have bands for every 10 nanometers. We cannot have a break. By having that, uh, we may end up uh, having more of bad bands. We may not have information in some of the bands in between. So those are the, despite the challenge, it is very useful for specific application and Hyperion is one of the uh, um, important and sensor which has been used in hyperspectral remote sensing. And the other one is uh, um, the thing which I have not covered in these four uh, is thermal remote sensing. And the thermal remote sensing is slightly different passive system compared to uh, uh, all the four uh, systems which I've discussed here because the thermal remote sensing, all the other three uh, emits energy instantaneously. Let's, let's whenever I'm clicking, the, the light which falls on an object immediately recorded by an object. Whereas in thermal remote sensing, it's slightly tricky because it takes some time to, uh, you know, emit a radiation and that has been recorded. Again, it is passive, but this has been taking with a time delay, which means um, when I am the short wave which we have received on an object is transferred as a long wave and then it is emitted. The time, there is a time delay between the absorption of heat and the emission of heat. So um, I have given some examples for uh, the panchromatic false color composite and hyperspectral imageries. The hyperspectral, the, the one on your right is a hyperspectral cube where uh, we, we generally visualize the bands which are uh, arranged one top of another in uh, the hyperspectral output. And thermal imagery is something, again, um, uh, here in thermal output, we generally see a difference in heat after processing. Uh, but uh, if you look at a raw image, uh, which has a black and white where the brightest portions are uh, having heavier, uh, higher temperature and the darker portion are relatively cooler. And uh, the one I have kept here is an example that from our own research work where we have processed uh, the thermal images of uh, different uh, cities in different places in India. And the one I have kept over here is uh, the wintertime thermal image of Delhi. Uh, and um, this shows uh, the temperature difference between the object where the other, other uh, systems of passive talks about the reflection, whereas here it talks about mostly the temperature difference between object A and object B. So based on that, we can able to uh, identify and distinguish objects. So the sensitivity of detectors are maintained with the help of liquid nitrogen in general cases, but there are many thermal remote sensing or thermal acquiring sensors exist in the market, but I'm with, uh, the most common one is mercury uh, cadmium telluride. So if this generally helps you to cover observe temperature changes in the landform over the larger area. So now comes to active remote sensing system. So the least common among the active remote sensing system is uh, sonar, which has been used below waters to look at uh, the water depth and water column and so on. Whereas uh, the LIDAR is the most popular among the technology. Um, it has been, um, it is basically based on the laser lights. And then uh, the laser lights, when it emits from a sensor, it passes through the atmosphere and it falls on a surface and then it backscattered to the sensor. So this travels in the form of point clouds. I'll come in detail about it. Whereas if you look at radar, radar is slightly different from radar. Radar uses radio detection and ranging and which is uh, achieved by measuring the time delay. Basically, we call it as backscattered uh, uh, signal that a radar system provides a signal and that signal reaches the ground and it echoed after backscattered from an object and then it received back in the sensor and once you receive back in the sensor we can able to discriminate it let's say we can able to identify uh, its characteristics um, based on its intensity we can able to identify the height based on the time delay it has taken to reach all those things can be done so I'll go one by one in uh, the most popular ones in active uh, remote sensing system. Uh, the one, the image that you are seeing in the background is, um, uh, it's a LIDAR output in which the images were draped, the true color composite was draped so that you can able to see the buildings. Uh, it, we are able to see the building curvatures, let's say the tree, shape of a tree, shape of a car, shape of a building, roads. It's all possible because of, uh, the fine resolution LIDAR data set which has been used. 
And if you look at it, there are a few, uh, on your right, you can see an aeroplane. And uh, this is a typical LIDAR system in which uh, we, utilize, we keep a sensor and uh, the, the laser beams are provided. Mm -hmm. And by using a laser beam, we'll get a backscattered energy. And once we receive it back in the sensor, we can able to get it footprint. Yeah. And we can able to get it, uh, uh, you know, the characteristics of objects on the ground. Uh, this is, let's say, if I'm trying to give an example, if I'm trying to give an example for it, let's say if you utilize uh, a LIDAR data, which is slightly different from the multispectral data, um, let's say there is a car which is standing in the um, center of uh, the ground, which is empty. And uh, if I use a LIDAR system, if I use an imaging system, I can able to see there is a ground, I can able to see there is a car which is standing in between. But if I use a LIDAR data, and if the point clouds are not close, not close enough, then what if I get a point, if I get one point which has been dropped on top of a car, another point which is falling on top of the uh, homogeneous surface, then what I may able to get is just a relative height between uh, uh, two of this. Like one, we can uh, say that height of a car and the relative height of the ground because we are getting one point each. Uh, in two different places. Whereas if we, if the point clouds are nearby, if the point clouds are close enough in LIDAR, we may able to get even a shape of the car, even the, uh, the back side of the car, front side of the car, where the headlights located and all the small curvatures can be picked up if the point cloud density is higher. So uh, I understand some of you are uh, interested in playing with LIDA. We can play after that because it's quite disturbing. I'm sorry for interrupting. Yeah, so uh, um, we can have this point densities as close as possible uh, to get the maximum curvature uh, of the surface. So LIDAR's point density is important. And LIDAR is again uh, having something called footprint. Like we don't have uh, the concept of pixels here. We get a footprint where it depends on the angle and altitude uh, in which the laser beams are projected. And another important thing to learn in LIDAR uh, is uh, the returns. So the, when a light beam has been sent from, uh, the coherent light energy has been sent from the sensor to the ground, Sometimes it falls on a particular object completely. Sometimes half of the energy passes through it. Let's say if you have a leaf and uh, the entire the point that you're making from LIDAR, which falls on a leaf completely, then you get an entire information about a leaf. But if it falls on the edges of a leaf, you get a chance like some of the energy is returned after hitting the leaf and some passes through the next uh, level. It may hit a branch, Thereafter, it made the root and uh, all those things are possible. When it hit the top of the leaf, that is called the first return. And when it further moves on, it's a second return and the third return and thereafter it has been caused. So um, it can able to get more than one return so that we can able to get it. Because of this, we can able to get DSMs, DEM uh, and so on. So the, the possible outcomes you can get out of LIDAR is the 3D model, intensities, classifications, and so on. It has been used widely in forestry, especially tree height mapping, canopy estimation, um, topography mapping, bathymetry, and atmospheric applications. The atmospheric application is uh, slightly different than what you have uh, discussed so far, because this is something of pointing up LIDAR, where the LIDAR energy has been sent towards atmosphere and the interaction with the particles in atmosphere, especially with uh, the aerosols and clouds, can be picked up by this uh, uh, pointing up Doppler lighters. So the next um, topic on uh, active remote sensing is uh, radar. The radar system initially um, started with side-looking radars, which is quite famous, and it has been a larger application uh, along with an aerial imaging because these were kept in aircraft and it looks at the sites to receive the backscatter signal. As I, were, as I told you earlier, when the signals come from the sensor, you can see it falls on uh, the trees, it falls on the uh, house. This is a complete energy which has sent and it returns, some of this returned earlier than the tree because the signal from the house reaches the sensors back much faster than the tree relatively. So because of this, you can able to discriminate the distance between an object, elevation between the objects and so on. 
but this uh, side looking radar is again uh, had a problem uh, people started utilizing the side looking radar started mapping topography started uh, mapping uh, um, uh, started mapping objects but it has a problem in which uh, um, the area it covered and the, the the final resolution we require at the end depends on the length of the antenna which is relative um, to each other so in that case the antenna's length was supposed to be bigger if you are going for a fine resolution imagery and if you are going further from the space uh, further from the air uh, in that case uh, the system was supposed to transfer from aircrafts to satellites the day it would require to move to satellite we cannot hold a kilometer length of camera in satellites as an antenna in satellites so that uh, you know uh, created an opportunity for synthetic antennas uh, synthetic aperture radars where the antennas are synthesized uh, in space so that it can still able to provide a uh, equivalent amount of uh, resolution and equivalent amount of output even by uh, you know kept in space so it is very helpful that's what the image synthetic aperture radar has emerged. The one you are seeing, the image you are seeing is uh, a synthetic aperture radar, is an example of synthetic aperture radar. And it has so many uh, applications that application include, uh, includes bi in biosphere, you can have deforestation, degradation, monitoring, biodiversity mapping, and also you can see the uh, earthquake, especially. Uh, you uh, sorry, uh, you can unmute and continue, sir. Uh, participants are really irritating. They are unmuting themselves and disturbing the presentation. Please cooperate with us. Niti, you can unmute yourself. I have muted all. Oh, got it. Thank you. So, um, and then we have something called in Creosphere applications. We are we can use the synthetic aperture radar to look at. The extent of ice, we can look at uh, the changes which happens in uh, ice topography and so on. And also in hydrosphere, soil moisture and flooding, especially uh, the inundation mapping for which we can use synthetic aperture radars. And to summarize the platforms we have, uh, um, we have different platforms. The one which has been kept uh, several kilometers away above the ground is called space bone technology, space bone platforms where uh, you have intermediate uh, which are airborne platforms and you have something at the ground which are called uh, ground based platform and uavs are somewhere uh, it's between uh, one you know below one kilometer of height so that from the ground so it is uh, mostly falling on the ground based and sometimes it is an airborne technology it depends on the size of the uav as well so um, the platforms are summarized the ground based uh, remote sensing do exist uh, most of the time the ground based remote sensing helps you to see horizontally and sometimes helps you to see uh, um, up from the ground. The image that you are seeing second uh, is an example of uh, uh, the NASA's aeronet station that I used to maintain uh, uh, during my PhD time in Hong Kong. So this uh, NASA aeronet station is kept in ground on top of a building. And this helps you to look at uh, the aerosol uh, activities, aerosol which is coming up from China to Hong Kong. and um, this is an automated robotic network that can monitor it, it measures the size, and then it transmits directly to the uh, uh, sensor in NASA. So it is a, a technology where it helps you to continuously monitor air pollution in the region. And similarly, you have, uh, this is a uh, uh, Doppler LiDAR, which we use to look at uh, um, the changes which happens in aerosol and also uh, other things uh, in atmosphere which is pointing up lighter and the airborne technology when it comes to an airborne uh, generally it is a stable wing uh, where a helicopter or airplane or uavs were used and uh, it can go up to 50 kilometers and most of the time it is of research aircraft where NOAA and uh, different agencies in the uh, us has been utilizing uh, those kind of studies conducting those kind of studies across the world and the one we have used uh, is like the images that you are seeing on the right extreme right and bottom uh, is a thermal image that we have used uh, with the help of the fly helicopter we have here. So we have kept a thermal sensor and uh, flew over uh, the city of Hong Kong to identify the uh, hotspots because uh, it was a it was an exercise that we uh, handled with multiple sensors. We had satellites, we had uh, um, 
ground crew measuring temperature and we have this thermography using helicopter and all those things were uh, managed at the same time. And then we have something space borne technology. Space borne technology among this is uh, slightly costlier, but it provides a wide range of coverage and it is repetitive. So this is most of our satellite uh, works in this way and uh, the satellites are kept in space and that is providing continuous monitoring and we call it as earth observation. And again, it, uh, it can be classified into two groups. One is uh, uh, geostationary satellites. Another one is uh, sun synchronized satellites. The geostationary satellites generally located in a particular altitude above a particular place so that it can constantly look after a place and it provides uh, an information. Generally, it has been used for uh, weather and telecommunication. Um, but these days, those geostationary satellites can also be used for Earth observation. But these satellites are kept at a very large altitude, like say in thousands of uh, kilometers from uh, the surface. Whereas if you look at sun synchronized, which covers a larger area on the Earth, and it is uh, also called as polar orbiting satellite, that is kept around 700 to 1000 kilometers from the ground. So these are the different ways in which it has kept. And now when it comes to the remote sensing data, because uh, uh, many of you are working in remote sensing technology, some are uh, trying to do because most of them, most of you may be a student who wants to use the technology as well. Uh, we have uh, different remote sensing data sets available with us. Some are, uh, uh, you know, one category of that uh, is a traditional aerial photographs which people have used to um, understand changes happens in cities. Let's say most of the urban local bodies in the country were uh, utilizing aerial photographs in the past, where uh, um, regular surveys were conducted by uh, both the government agencies and sometimes by private agencies as well to understand the changes happen in the city. It has its own merit, even though the other technologies has come up because it can able continuously I mean, whenever we want to do, we can able to fly and uh, the atmospheric attenuations are uh, fewer compared to other uh, space borne technology. And, um, uh, and we can only fly through the area that we require. Whereas in case of uh, satellite imagery, uh, we can, though the technology is good enough, we can able to get uh, a fine resolution data. We can able to see a small object on the ground from space. But it comes with its own demerits because the repetitive cycle, I mean, the temporal resolution is uh, fewer and uh, we, we, we need to place an order. Sometimes we need to depend on technology, which is um, uh, outside the country and a uh, lot of things, a lot of process involved in it. So the nodal agencies for aerial photograph in India is Survey of India. The, they provide the survey and they have a lot of aerial photographs. If somebody is interested on in a particular area, you can able to write it and mostly it is given for academic purposes and the link for that is uh, given there. And uh, the, another aerial uh, observation uh, is uh, carried out with the help of LIDAR. So LIDAR is a uh, sensor uh, widely utilized with aerial observations um, because that is close range and it helps us to get uh, uh, you know more details on the surface. When it comes to satellite imageries, we can uh, able to get some of the data sets, which is available in three different forms. Um, it is available either for free, which we call it as open data, and um, uh, like Landsat, which you can download it. The, at least the level one product can be downloaded for free. And uh, le, you know thereafter, the other products you can, uh, you can place a request and take on. And the second one is uh, free for research, like sometimes uh, even a satellite, uh, uh, better resolution satellite images are available after submitting a research proposal. They won't give you straight away for free, but if you submit a proposal, you can get uh, free satellite images. And the third one is completely purely commercial where you need to pay for every square foot of data or uh, you need to pay for a particular scene. So the rates are fixed and you can access it. But however, there are restrictions in different countries to acquire a certain resolution data. So that's a challenge. So, but it has its advantage. It can, uh, you can able to get data of anywhere in the world in different scales. So some of the platform in which you can get it, Buen, you have some limited data sets of India uh, available on that portal. And then Earth Explorer, which has been widely used by us for uh, downloading other data sets, including Landsat and other uh, open data sets available uh, across the globe. And uh, the software, when it comes to software pre-processing, uh, I would say again, it is uh, discriminated into three categories. One is open source, which is completely free 
the download and even for commercialization. And the other one is free, but you can only use it for research and restricted capability. Let's say in case of last tools, you can only classify certain thousands of data points. I mean, cloud points uh, where the commercial version allow you to do uh, more number of cloud points. Similarly, the uh, commercial softwares, uh, as we all know, like for, um, you know, we have NV, Edas, Imagine, and so on for image processing. And uh, the another, this is about the desktop computing. If you require a software at your own machine, whereas if you're looking for uh, cloud computing where you, you don't need to download a data because the satellite data sets are, the remote sensing data sets are generally voluminous, so you don't have to download it. You can directly use it uh, in the server. Like you can select a data, you can either select a tool or you can provide your own algorithm and uh, you can do the processing in remote server, which means the, the data you have selected and the algorithm you have applied will be applying, will be processed in the remote server generally with the help of the supercomputers and it processes the output and provides you in a format that you require. Maybe you can take it as a raster file, vector files, uh, generally, you know, in a simple raster files, you can take an output after processing. You can only receive a product rather than downloading whole input data sets and have a, you know, um, sophisticated or the costly systems, uh, the costly softwares, you can use this for free. An Earth Engine from Google generally provides this. You can register yourself in a while. Uh, this a lot of interesting data sets are available in that. But in any case, if you are confused at any point, if you are confused to look at uh, what did, software I need to use for my application and how can I choose a software, because there are so many open source softwares, there are so many uh, people who have provided a software. Some are good in one thing, some are good in other thing. So these are the two links which helps you to identify the right product for your application and they may help you to navigate based on different filters so that you can find the right product on your own. So um, there are different applications in remote sensing when it comes to application. Uh, you, you have application in agriculture, forestry. I'll take one or two examples in each of that. In agriculture, we look at uh, uh, the, um, uh, what do you call the surface temperature has been widely used and we can look at the drought monitoring and for forest we can look at biomass species modeling and for geology we look at uh, the surface topographical changes and other applications and for hydrology we utilize it for uh, um, uh, the drainage mapping and also for the let's say see in for sea ice we can use it for sea surface mapping and also for changes in sea cover uh, especially even for albedos, there's a change in uh, albedo of ice. And for, for land use and land cover, we, we are very well aware that we use the uh, generally multispectral data sets for looking at changes in land use and land covers. And for ocean and coastal, uh, that's interesting. We can look at uh, the coastal changes. We can look at, we can use remote sensing for, um, uh, what do you call, even for uh, tracking um, uh, vessels or other objects on the ocean surface and changes happens in ocean surface like temperature change, uh, other uh, chlorophyll changes and other uh, uh, ocean color changes. And also we can monitor atmosphere and uh, some people say uh, uh, clouds in the satellite remote sensing are errors, but at times those errors becomes an important data and these days we started studying clouds as well. So the main purpose of studying uh, remote sensing, I just want to touch upon uh, there's something called sustainable development goals, which we uh, likely to connect many of our uh, projects and many of our uh, teaching also in line with the sustainable development goals in our university. And uh, these are the 17 goals which were given by um, United Nations uh, as an agenda for 2030. And many of the country have promised for uh, the development. And what we can see is almost all 17 goals rely on location, especially geoinformatics. And that includes GIS, GNSS, and also our remote sensing. And uh, for continuous monitoring of things, uh, remote sensing plays a really crucial role. And um, in order to achieve sustainable development and the technology of geospatial technology, especially remote sensing, plays a very vital role. So, and uh, I would like to move on to uh, uh, our last section that is on opportunities for graduates. Uh, this is just based on whatever I have uh, uh, gained and what I can like to share with some of the students. 
um, when it comes to let's say if you are a graduate uh, if you are a graduate of geoinformatics or spatial information technology or if you are a graduate of remote sensing uh, because the course has been offered in different names in different institutes in in, in the country so if you take this um, course and perhaps you can teach in geography geology civil engineering computer science in addition to other courses which is generally offered in geoinformatics, geomatics, and spatial science. When I say I'm not talking about the eligibility criteria of the course, because all these courses have a subject on geoinformatics, especially remote sensing, in one or more than one papers. And when it comes to the research jobs, which is quite uh, popular with uh, by learning this geoinformatics uh, technology, we have uh, generally people goes outside the country or within the country for PhD after. Uh, master, especially MSc and MTech, and there are wide varieties of scholarships are available at national and international level for the subject. And um, there's again the scholarship can be divided into uh, three forms internationally. Uh, um, I'll come back to the Indian scholarship where the international scholarships divided into three forms. One is the scholarship funded by the uh, central agencies. Let's say uh, every country has a, a government agency, like let's say UGC for India. And those central agencies provide a scholarship for people to study in their country. That is one. The second one is a university level scholarship. The university level scholarship, let's say generally the university has some research budget and it has been segregated for each of the department and department calls for certain PhD positions in which people can apply. So the third important thing is uh, uh, the research supervisors fund let's say this is supervisors grabs a big project and he wants to take student who is having an international exposure so those uh, projects can also support phd uh, scholars so these are the three ways in which uh, the fourth one is self-finance which is unpopular so the three major ways in which people goes abroad uh, and do the research work and uh, when it comes to national we have so much uh, uh, funding agencies especially uh, the national level funding, uh, the major chunk comes from Department of Science and Technology and some from University Grants Commission. And uh, the others, uh, we have uh, department level fundings, mostly from research uh, supervisors level funding for completing PhDs. Apart from PhD also, there are research positions available. Uh, JRF and SRF has some restrictions. You need to uh, ha have certain qualification for that, where it, the postdoctoral positions do exist uh, in the field and uh, uh, it available within uh, the government organizations also, even private R&Ds as well. So this field is not limited to uh, one discipline. It, uh, it has been widely spread and uh, the importance has been gaining. Uh, these are some of the positions which are available for uh, graduates in industry, consultant, uh, analyst, uh, technicians, developers, and uh, the industry, uh, requires uh, some of these uh, skills and uh, some of most of the time we uh, take a back step because sometimes we feel the uh, the coding skills are required yes the coding skills are required that gives you a different uh, uh, you know um, attire but if you have other skills definitely you have a, a better uh, job position here and um, there are different uh, positions based on different capabilities available in the field and uh, some requires an advanced geospatial software some industry some companies would like to work you know like you to work on open source softwares because they cannot afford or they don't want to work on open source commercial software so they prefer students to work on open source software so and uh, of course uh, they expect students to be in the latest development of course uh, they want the student to be uh, you know clear with the basic subject so one last slide from my side this is uh, like uh, i from the department of uh, natural resources this is what we have uh, offered to student when we craft our syllabus when we review every three four years we make sure that uh, we are uh, in line with the industry and that really helps us to get uh, even students uh, getting placed in this uh, tough situations so uh, this is if somebody if wanna, if you are a bachelor student if, if you are interested in uh, taking up a course you can you are uh, most free to visit uh, our uh, web page uh, at uh, msg informatics teleuniversity.ac.in uh, and also you can feel free to write it to me this is my contact details and uh, thank you so much for listening and uh, i'd like to take the, an opportunity again to thank uh, Dr. Jyoti and the institution for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much, Niti. Uh, we will take the questions after uh, Arun's presentation. That will be sure. Fine. Okay. Sure. Thanks for a nice presentation. Thank uh, you. Then I will now request uh, Mr. Arun. Arun, are you ready? Hello. Arun, are you there? Can you hear me? Sorry. Sorry, I'm not very comfortable with the Zoom, so. Okay, okay. Yes, no, no issues, no issues. Your screen is visible now. Uh, can you unmute yes. your screen? Like your face is not visible, Arun. Just let me. Okay, okay. Take your time. So anyways, the video is not uh, enabling now. Probably the poor network or something, I don't know. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah, you can, you can go ahead with the sharing, presentation. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can you make it full screen, Arun? Yeah, it's, it's happening, it's happening. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Okay, yeah. Hi, uh, good afternoon all of you. And uh, there's a very nice presentation from Niti. And also I'm seeing him very after a very, very long time. And uh, also I'm seeing one more person, Dr. TV, sir. Hi, sir, how are you? After a long time, I'm seeing him in the chat. And also Deepangris is around. And Jyoti is also, I know her so long time. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm just going to make a presentation on WebGIS. So it is uh, not like what uh, Nitya has done. It is uh, a very professional academic person he has done. But rather I'm going to speak more on how we do a work, some basic architecture. And I'll show some of these examples. Probably the one of the projects that we are working, that couple of slides, I'll go more deep into that. So you get more idea about uh, like uh, on what basis uh, WebGIS, how it can be designed and used for your own purpose. So let me start now. I'll just show, go with what is uh, basic, what is JS and uh, what is uh, WebGIS. Web is basically a uh, internet, data over the internet, and then you have to supply it back to the client. So it's a web and then combination of web with a JS. So JS is a real world abstraction and you know JS can be used to identify the opportunities and there are methods and tools and theories to analyze. So combination of these two is known as a WebGIS in industry. So why WebGIS is required? So if we understand what is the characteristics of this WebGIS, so we can understand why it was required. So it's a global reach. It is not restricted to one person or two person. Any person who is having a browser can access this GIS thing. So that is the most important uh, need for the web GIS. And then lots of the audience can be addressed. And it is a uh, cross platform. It is, not, it is not dependent on any one particular platform. You can use any of these uh, browsers like Mozilla, Chrome, different technologies like .NET, Java, different OSs. So any user can access from the different platform. That is another uh, need for this WebGIS. And it's very low cost actually, when it is larger scale, larger user group, the scale is, then it is less, otherwise it is equivalent to what you have it in a desktop version. And easy to use, most, most of the difficulties will be taken over by the developers and only the very few uh, functions and options are provided to the user. So in a way it is very useful and easy to use and unified update, no need to update each and every user. It is like once a browser is latest and then it can access that particular content. A lot of applications, diverse applications, there is no limit like uh, where JS can't be used now, only the imagination is a limit. Otherwise it can be used in any other applications, any other domain, any other platforms. 
So there's a concept called geo neo geography, which has come long, way back in uh, 2007, but it is actually happening now, which is also like a mashup kind of a thing, which pulls the data from the different sources and then put it in a single platform for the user for the ready use. So these are all the, some of the characteristics I put. And basically when the WebGIS started, it is basically for the mapping and visualization on query. And later it moved on to the collection of geospatial information. So many people started contributing the information like placing a point, drawing a boundary and then POIs and all those uh, started happening like wiki maps, open street maps and all those things. So Goodchild termed the coil VJ volunteered geographic information. It's basically the crowdsourcing kind of thing. Okay, so the other functions of WebGIS is dissemination of information. So we store the information and then we have to distribute that spatial data information at various scale and then various attribute information related to the particular spatial attribute. And we also do a lot of spatial analysis in the desktop. And uh, right now, many of these uh, geoprocessing options are available on the web, though it is a little slow. But if we move to the cloud JS, it is much faster. But still in web JS, uh, we are having these options of navigation, optimum path, location search, like, and then proximity, buffering, nearby. All these options are available. And JS is becoming more of a business model now. So you can see many of these uh, hospitality industries uh, using the GIS as one of their core base for their businesses and location-based services. Advertisements also location-based. So GIS is there in massive scale used in the commercially, but most of them are not actually the GIS uh, professionals, but still they use it. For e-governance, there is a mapping, query, mashup, decision making, and n number. I just put few here. So we'll go to the very basic architecture of like what is WebJS, how it works. There is a web portal. So there is a JS data store, JS data store. There is a WMS, WFS. I'll just go to uh, go through each and every one of these. So map services, feature services, and then the data is being uh, fetched, retrieved, and then sent to the client interface. So this is the basic architecture. Now we'll see what is the difference between your basic web op web page operation. In the web page operation, the browser uh, sends a request to this web server, in HTTP, and then gets a response back. So the client client gets a response. But in the web service, there are a couple of uh, service types of services are there. SOAP and REST. And what I'm showing here is a kind of a SOAP uh, services. It uses XML. When it comes to the REST service, it uses a JSON. That's the only difference. Otherwise, uh, the request sends and then this request is received by web service and then whatever the re request received by the web service and then it parses it and then calls the particular function and then creates a response to the particular XML request and then sends this particular response back to the client. And then once it is received, that also passes through. So this uh, spatial uh, services being operated in a slightly more complicated way than a normal basic web page operation. Okay, now we'll see what are all these different types of uh, services that we have. Uh, these are all the services. And normally any WebGIS uh, portals or sites use. The map services, map services are basically the image services and the images are getting cached in your local asset .png or jpeg images. So the rendering happens in the client side and feature services is like a, a layers, uh, interoperable layers where you can do the queries and then get the attribute information out of that particular query. And there is a coverage services, which is a grid services. Again, you can compare it with a map service the only Advantage with the grid is like you actually access our original raster image where you can perform this uh, clip operation, uh, all of the NDVA processing, all on the web only, browser only. So, this is a three different basic operation uh, services available. Next is the two different advanced services are like routing services, which 
everybody does know that uh, what Google uses or ESRI uses. So how we find the path between the two locations and all. So that is all coming through the routing services. And then finally, there is a geoprocessing services. Geoprocessing services not only about the clipping, it is not about the um, uh, doing the proximity analysis. It is a lot more than that. There are many processes are getting added over the web. But still, desktop patients are uh, having an edge of doing the geoprocessing um, services. Now, there is an open geospatial consortium that org or the setting the standards for all these web services these are all the web services standards being set so interoperability between uh, the domains and technologies happens uh, without any problems so it's a seamless operations is a main intention so these standards uh, if you want to read more about it you can go and uh, search in the uh, ogc.org and you get the details of all these services so basically um, in WebJS architecture, you have a database uh, which is connected with um, JS server and then in, in return JS server also get connected with the web server which is normally IES uh, we use it and then through the internet we will get connected to the client. So this is uh, like a one uh, straight linear relationship. I am showing it for a better understanding. So JS database can be a single user or a multi-user version database where you can give access to a user on over the browser like online only you can do the editing to the processing and all. So different kind of operations on the JS database also can be done through the web server, JS server and to the database. So this is a possibility now. But who is supposed to be allowed, who is not to be allowed is administrator's decision. So he is supposed to decide. And RJS serv servers are like uh, you have a 2D, 3D globes, uh, uh, address services like uh, geolocation services, and you have a geoprocessing, and you can even develop your own customized geoprocessing. And two types I already mentioned SOAP and REST services are um, supported. And caching is the most important when it comes to the web application because uh, um, performance is the most critical requirement and where the most of this js with js application fail so caching and optimizing at each and every level there are many many uh, um, things are there where we can do the optimization uh, starting from how we start digitizing particular feature instead of creating a lot of nodes and vertices if we capture it simple for the web application purpose so your rendering will be much faster even though you create a tile uh, base base map services or even a feature services so it is starting from a digitization and then what is the projection you use about the on the fly, on the fly transformation of a projection so all this contributes uh, to the performance of your web application with gis and the other characteristics are like it's a centralized uh, and uh, distributor. You can keep it in one place or you can pull the values or uh, data from the different sources and then show it in a one browser. There are a lot of rules and relationships we can build like uh, you can't have a building over the road uh, something like that. It's a very um, so many rules we can build and then we can ensure that well data capturing over the web also we can enforce the people not to do kind of these kind of errors and then multi-user editing and then there is a versioning concept where the multi-users are allowed and then admin is the person who is going to taking care of all the final data available creation of the custom features and I mean, data security backup this all gets into the domain of a administrator so he, he need to take care of all these things so from the client side if you look at it the browser is a, basically the main client because very few people have access to the like RGS desktop, Explorer, Google Earth, or any specialized software, QGIS, or whatever it is. So the best is a web browser, and then any of any best um, application, WebJS applications are happening nowadays. It's all compatible with the latest uh, web browsers, and now the mobile j is actually taking away the space of uh, web gis any location based applications are, are rather more uh, easily developed over the mobile 
just because the location is enabled and then uh, it is like uh, people are moving and then anytime they can access like which is a nearest location and all, all those things so that is the advantage of mobile still web is also having a lot of advantages in terms of accessing a massive data and doing them and geo processing so challenges the, the biggest challenge is a load of a users on the gis server how many concurrent users can access the server how many people can at a time uh, read and write a data in the database what is the pressure on the internet what is the bandwidth available and what is the capabilities of your browser and end of the day it is a how good is your end user if he is not able to understand the purpose of particular application then whole whole effort goes wrong so whenever we develop any application we have to keep in mind who is the end user it is not necessarily 100% we can satisfy the people but mainly we have to target our user and accordingly we start developing our applications so there's a concept of a thick and thin client and nowadays most of the applications are developed mostly thin or in between where there is not much of a load in the client side and much of a load is happens only in the server side so it it gives a limited user interaction and uh, processing is not required at all. so it is very user friendly from the client side whereas a thick client is like when there is a online editing is required special plugins are required to be installed through the browser so that uh, users can actually do a specialized kind of activity and then this is becoming a bit of a thick client where the processing actually happens in the client side so not many people can install it that is one of the in, uh, bottleneck in this approach and then internet bandwidth it consumes a lot of internet. so the as a best practice is uh, we have to manage it between a very thin to very thick so uh, as a best practice what we normally do is we keep the database in the server side base maps query analysis all these activities happens only in the server side whereas the operational layers the layers which is used by the client to do the query is made available in the client side so if for example if he is doing a identify tool on particular building so you just click on the building feature layer and then that sends a request back to the um, rgs service so the server responded back with a, a toast or a pop-up message so your client gets that information fast also so in a way it is this is how most of the applications are now designed to keep in mind the load is not going to be very heavy on the server side as well as in the client side okay what is a base map base map is like we, all of us are very much aware of the google map the google map can be used in any of the application as a base map also the base map is like basically it is a cached tile um, images of a um, multi resolution are uh, getting stored for just used for a reference in the background so it can be on the server side it is getting processed so client side um, the efforts are getting reduced only where the client is actually zooming in or navigating there only the particular tiled jpeg or png images are getting stored in its local cache so this also can be managed in a multiple ways um, like a selective caching and then complete cache and then user request cache and all those things but basically it is a cache at the server level is always a good for a client end there is a operational layer this operational layer is your building layer or your road layer or any point of interest of any layer so this layer we are going to use to query particular information or we may be doing a kind of a proximity analysis like a select a point and find out how many buildings are within 100 meter range so both both or more uh, layers should be made available at the operational layer to do this kind of analysis and this kind of analysis can be managed in many ways uh, for the performance perspective if this project area is very small then if the kind of a request that is 
known from the client side we can actually pre populate those results in the attribute and then give the instant uh, response back to the client it is all about uh, the, the extent we are going to work and then what is the purpose we are going to work so accordingly need to take a decision on whether to fetch the result directly from the server or already uh, the analysis done attribute results to be fetched to the particular geometry so this decision to be taken when you are designing your application so characteristics are it is relatively smaller than your base map and then it is very regularly uh, updated it is more uh, dynamic in nature and user can interact that is the main purpose of that layers and tools are like two types actually it's a client side or server side in client side easy to handle and then use usually the data is very small but in the server side data is very huge and then it takes a lot of processing time and then bandwidth so service oriented architecture this service oriented architecture is like instead of you are directly accessing your database uh, the APIs can be created of, as a services of a particular table or a views. So those so services are actually being uh, talking with each other application uh, uh, APIs and then particular uh, information is passed on to the browser. And this service oriented architecture is being followed across the industry now. It actually reduces uh, stress on the database and then it also creates a security at your database end and it is loosely coupled so anytime it is configuration also very easy so uh, if you look at it this is how normally your webjs application from the backend looks uh, webjs administrator is the one who actually defines the layer hierarchy assign the services and then remove the services that's his role the authorized users can view the map do the editing, deleting, insertion, doing the queries, and all sort of geoprocessing activities on the layers. He can do it, whereas a normal user can only view the maps and do the queries. So, web application should be. This is how the application should be. This is what the normally user wants. It should be fast, and it is all depends on the infrastructure. Now, um, even if you can't uh, host it in your own server, you can opt for a uh, infrastructure in the cloud and then host your services so it can be a little faster than your on premise and easy to use and hide all the complexity from the user this is the most important point in the whole creation of this particular of any applications don't give difficulty to the user try to hide maximum possible and then it should be more of a user friendly application and user also should have a fun and then have a better user experience of it so we need to consider all this when developing an application webjs application so in webjs what is next now it was started with the visualization and then it was like a map query and then went into map edit then people started contributing and then online geo processing now there is a cloud computing now actually it is a real time analytics ready data which is being contributed by AI, PL and IOTs. So there are a lot of technologies actually now aiding geospatial technology on the web. So a lot of uh, future in that particular aspect. Sorry for this word. Okay. So these are some of the stacks available. It is normally known to any of the GS persons. When it is coming to the JS, most mostly used is RJS server. That is a Geo server also is there in the open source. And that's a map server, map render, and open layers. Also, if you are a student want to start your own application, you better use all this open source and then host it uh, on your own. Okay, now I'll start my where I work, the Center for Special analytics and advanced js we are working on this project called agri js so this is where we uh, use a different types of data that is coming in and i'll just show you how we are uh, actually uh, integrating all the data to a plot level and we are also giving advisories to the 
uh, farmers. This uh, this actual project is actually happening in South Odisha. Uh, five blocks we are executing this project. So satellite images we use the Sentinel images, resource set image, cutter set image for a different purposes, and we have automated a method to extract um, water body extent and also using a SAR data to an extent we are able to identify the paddy crop and the status of the paddy crop also. So these are all the automated uh, method which actually uh, reads the information from the extract information from the satellite image, store it as an attribute. So in, actually the direct images are not coming to the plot. The attribute informations are interpolated and extrapolated and pushed into the plot information. And there is a soil data set. There are a lot of um, we have done a lot of soil testing across those five blocks, one thousand five hundred. Based on that, we have generated soil data, and then there is a crop suitability analysis we have done using the AHM model. And uh, accordingly, we are actually proposing or suggesting the crop um, farmers to go for a certain crops with a list of um, package of practices time and again like five times in a period we, we give this to the farmers and especially because it is uh, agriculture related we need to forecast what is the weather is going to be and then the, especially the area that we are working is uh, prone to a cyclone so and drought prone also once in every three years it's a drought prone so we have to give the proper forecast when to sow and then based on the forecast what to sow. So that is the most critical information that farmers are looking for from that particular area. So we also take uh, information from multiple sources, IMD, IBM and uh, also we chips. So multiple sources are there, we'll take it and then we will just uh, translate all the values into the plot level and based on all the information that goes through all the information that goes through this information is getting stored in a agri js core database market weather land management image analytics suitability analytics everything goes into the core database out of that we will just extract and then push the advisory database so this advisory database actually being can be accessed from the portal, AgriJS portal. It is any village or any plot in the five block 532 villages. You click on that, you, there are five components of advisories. So different advisories for weather, crop, ownership, animal husbandry. So animal husbandry details are getting actually surveyed and collected. All this information and then respective advisories are provided. Okay, there are multiple ways. Uh, we know that farmers can't access uh, the portal or mobile devices. So there are people from the Tatra Trust working in the field to disseminate this particular information to the farmers. Okay, so finally I'll come to uh, whenever there is a re um, to be developed anything to de develop any software or application. This is a process we normally follow requirement analysis. How do we conceptualize? What is the hardware software requirement? Database design with GIS and then application development, finally hosting and maintenance. That's the most critical part of it. There are some useful links. Uh, I'll share this uh, PDF with Jyoti so she can share it across to all you people. And because I'm, I think I'm running out of time now. So there's one more uh, link of uh, YouTube there's some 51 videos we have loaded from our last international uh, workshop on spatial analytics and deep learning for the geospatial applications uh, people can access it it was uh, loaded hosted uh, last week only so anyone can access it and then use it so that's it thank you Thank you, Arun. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, now I think we can take uh, questions uh, right now. Uh, participants have posted lots of questions. Oh, I haven't seen that. Just okay, I, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, take one by one. Uh, I think Dipankar can also help me in moderating uh, the question answer session. Okay, uh, thank you, Jyoti. 
thanks arun uh, and neeti for a, a wonderful presentation and i'm sure the uh, listeners and uh, everybody who was on the call had a, a fruitful experience i think uh, the intent of the webinar series is being served by getting in uh, you know august and eminent speakers like uh, the uh, speakers in the past and the speakers from this current session also uh, to talk about uh, the various advances in geographical thought geographical design as well plus the uh, science and technology applications within gis i think uh, we'll start with the questions uh, that have been raised uh, within the chat box and i could see uh, tv sir had actually spoken about uh, uh, let's let me go with arun's uh, first because that's the last one so his question was like tell us how effective and useful uh, your prop gis is so any thoughts on that arun uh, actually this is the second year we are into this particular project uh, we have started with the 1042 uh, plots in 23 villages in two blocks say in south odisha um though there is a technology we develop there is a need for a human intervention especially when it comes to the agriculture because uh, the penetration of a network is not that good and then the people are not that much aware of like how to use a mobile or web tools and even if the particular information provided in a local language would you are there and not making out any information out of it like so it was a little difficult we are we are working in a model like um, it is a tool we are developing it but it is not the only solution for um, the agriculture so we have uh, developed other tools as well based on the portal we are sending out um sms in the local language now and we are also having operational call centers with the five people so those who can call the farmers regularly and then farmers also call back and there is also a field intervention person so who go regularly to meet the farmers so technology is only the tool right now because still a lot of other uh, technologies also we are utilizing it to make this particular idea more effective and useful in the field thanks arun um, the other question that tv sir had was uh, why not give them some uh, you know tips on analytics on uh, gis programming analytics um gis programming analytics uh, okay sir so actually this is um, um geo processing over the web is chill a lot of uh, resource content i can show some of the websites uh, the links are that i've shared and that that i can show but otherwise i can also share some of the codes which we can uh, the user can use it and, and themselves they can experience it how it can be done all right uh, arun just one more question uh, that has come immediately now uh it is like uh, what is the contemporary or present technology that is dominating web gis uh, is it automation of producing dynamic maps uh, where should an aspiring web gis uh, developer focus or equip himself automation the yeah. one word one word reply to it is uh, automation because yeah. um, so the most of the information now it is uh, analytics ready data if you are getting into the remote sensing and all those things people are not very interested in getting into the processing of the image like basic data they take process and then finally bring it to the usable level and then do the ntva analysis or whatever the analysis and then extract the information um, most of the people are not in that uh, kind of a, uh, interest in doing a uh, times to be spent under people wanted readily available data okay so there is a lot of automation right now happening in the field of ai and deep learning so any satellite image related informations are getting available as a features and attributes iot sensor informations also make made available instantaneously so you know that how how many twitter tweets are coming every minute so all this informations are need to be synced seamlessly to the geography that is the most challenging part even for a twitter it is not very easy for anyone to actually map it to a particular location even today uh, unless it is the message is not 
properly coded or IP address is not correctly mapped. So a lot of challenges are there. So bringing in all the different sources of information into a sync and then seamlessly providing an output or a solution to the user. So automation, automation is one of the biggest challenge and then this is happening nowadays. Arun, uh, that was good from the technology side and from the side of a, 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 an app developer or a, a, or a GIS analyst who has gone out of geography and learned the skill sets and uh, how or he or she maps. Uh, how do you think uh, and what are the operational challenges that you're facing with your current project on AgriGIS in Western Odisha? Uh, or was it Southern Odisha? So there is a question about what is the operational challenge and uh, how do you connect with the farmers using this uh, sort of an advanced tool. Anything that you would like to share with the listeners? The operational challenges, uh, actually as I mentioned already, um, there, is, there is a problem in communicating to them. Um, one of the biggest problems that we are having right now with RJS is uh, we can't do it in Odia. We can do only English and Hindi at the max in India now. So language is still not there to make it Uriya. Uh, secondly, um, most of the things that what I show, uh, like what we are doing it in the web, many things are still not possible on the mobile side. Because of the, um, it's a heavy lifting. We are doing a lot of heavy lifting in terms of a data and then size of it. It will be quite challenging because uh, people can't access a laptop, but most of them are actually having a, a mobile device to access our application. Even after they access our application, the best thing what they can understand is a weather forecast because it's a number. They can understand, okay, tomorrow it is going to rain, day after tomorrow it is going to rain. Beyond that, anything related to your crop. So any technical thing or fertilizers you mentioned in English and all, all those things, it's very tricky and it is very difficult for us to convey. So this is the reason we are having this uh, three more approaches, SMS, uh, call center, and then also a direct interactive uh, resource person to interact with the farmers. So we are also getting a feedback for how good it is, how usable it is, and how bad it is. We get those feedbacks also from the farmers. Okay, there's another question about uh, data piracy and how secure is WebGIS? Um, in India, I don't think there is any piracy related uh, things are taken seriously because we are also accessing some of the land record sites uh, from in Odisha. It is open to everybody. People are not worried about it and then they simply mention that those who are uh, using it as are at uh, risk not the person who is uh, using it there is no restriction piracy is a little we are far away from that particular issue in india I believe. <laughs> nicely put nicely put i think uh, the other question that uh, uh, had and i think uh, that is also i mean i'm reading a little more than the question itself would okay. be like, uh, what would be your advice to an aspiring uh, WebGIS uh, person? Like, if students want to get into WebGIS, what is it that they would like to, you would like them to focus on? So forget about uh, WebGIS or MobileJS, CloudJS, whatever it is. You just uh, you keep everything away. Uh, keep for a moment uh, what is that you wanted to do. That is the most important thing. So once you decide on what you want to do. The remaining things start falling place. Either you want to do the IoT or a machine learning or a WebJS or a mobile JS or all, all, all these things come later. The first thing is idea, which what is the idea you are going to develop upon? Once you are sure about what is your requirement or idea, then you can think about the tools. The tools are there plenty actually. It is only about the idea and then how you are actually conceptualizing that particular idea and then how you visualize that particular idea is going to be useful for the any end user. The end user can be a farmer or a doctor or anybody, but based on your end user, that a complete concept, based on that concept only you have to start thinking about particular 
uh, technology either it is a web or it is a cloud or it is a mobile but if you are asking me uh, in specific to the web then i strongly recommend the people to get into the geo server it is an open source tool it is always a good to explore it in an open source tool use a, uh, google maps as your background and uh, use a uh, feature editor tool do, do the proximity analysis of your own so these are all the things can be done very easily by the users without taking too much of spend spending too much of money or actually no money involved in that so people can take up this to do their own development but for me it's not a technology it's all about the idea well well put uh, arun it's not a technology it's about an idea i think uh, just one more question on uh, related to web gis because that keeps coming again and again is that how much of web gis is actually free and where is the world moving towards how much of the sorry can i get it again how Depends much of web gis is actually free like is it yeah arun did you hear yeah, yeah. yeah yeah please please go ahead how, how much of web gis is actually free is it completely free or is it proprietary we do know that there are uh, proprietary software but if you could share some ideas on that like uh, how much of it is free uh, i is suggest you completely? yeah yeah i i suggest you people in if it is in india you can use uh, kj is one of the best uh, gs implemented in karnataka almost every other department there is a gs application now uh, except to few of the applications uh, it's open to all the people very few land records or something where you need a sign in to get into the application otherwise it is fairly uh, open for people to use it like um, education or health people can access it even the bhuvan it's uh, open people can access it usgs is one of the fantastic uh, a resource it's open and even you can take the apis and download the data so whatever you want to do you can do it and there is uh, singapore one the best uh, geo processing applications you can see in the singapore one most of their uh, most of their analytic activities they just moved from uh, web to mobile now but still there are many plenty to explore actually even in single operations you try to understand how they are able to do it very quick and then giving the response back and the result back in a lightning speed that is the most important aspect people have to look into rather than just simply looking into like i'm placing a point creating a 1 meter buffer or a 1 km buffer what actually happens in the back end people should be more curious about uh, researching on that i feel so there are plenty you can access it it's all open only very few are like closed and uh, when it is a close the there is a edit option that you have to understand when there is a data people can manipulate or change then then people don't give access to the general public okay arun uh, there is another question about innovation in web gis like mm -hmm. how innovative can one be and uh, people would like to hear about your experiences anything that you would like to share about uh, innovation yeah in 2000 when we are in the college actually we think about how uh, the traffic uh, systems can be uh, so dynamic in nature like live in nature it, it was it happened uh, that time only in singapore but they improved a lot right now there is a lot of uh, improvement in terms of um, uh, finding a potholes in the road based on the video cameras they said the streaming in the lot of data is getting streamed in but you can't actually process each and every data set there is a lot of logic supplied onto it uh, video processing and then how do you sample it and then take it and then uh, actually take it for your output so th there is a statistics involved in it there is algorithm built into that there is js concepts also there so if you bring in everything there is iot deep learning and machine learning thing put together that is i think that fascinating thing that's happening in the uh, web js front many people are still trying it out it is not like uh, i can't give you any application that is fantastic as of now with all these features available but there are people who are trying it out still long way to go okay uh, arun mm -hmm. now it's the time for uh, i mean time we are dealing with coronavirus 
So okay. anything uh, coronavirus and web GIS. Plus the best, uh, best uh, application or a dashboard in the world for this particular coronavirus is a John Hopkins. The day we started hearing the coronavirus, they are the first one to put the uh, predictions, forecast, how it is going to go. But there is a lot of mismatches what they predicted in the early Jan and then now what is happening. But the way they have developed the uh, uh, application, the particular uh, dashboard, even the WHO, the World Bank. If you look into all these sites, there are fantastic dashboards are available for the coronavirus. But most of the things in coronavirus applications are like, what happened? It is like, what is the status till date? And to some methods, they find out what is going to happen, uh, like peaking different, different models, the statistical models, they're going to use it until when it is going to peak, when it is going to down and up. But many of the models, so if you have uh, followed it closely, and initially they were uh, debating like a tropical weather only it is going to affect our temperate weather, it is going to not, it is going to affect tropical, it is not going to be much affected. And those kind of hypotheses are gone. So that is the initial hypothesis built on the models built on those all gone haywire now. So there is a climate related uh, studies they are trying to relate many other factors, also spatial factors. But still, I don't think there is any one who is very successful in using the uh, spatial technology to understand uh, how it is going to spread or when it is going to peak. It is only the statistical modeling that people are doing it. The, this is where actually GIS should come in, but uh, we are a long way to go. Okay, I think uh, that's that's fair enough, Arun. Because uh, I hope we get there, and I hope that uh, we have some science which is able to link it to a special angle in some ways. I think mm -hmm. uh, GIS professionals should also work hand in hand with the medical fraternity and uh, vice versa. Uh, one of the questions that's uh, being asked is: Is there a place where we can get uh, uh, an information set on web GIS? I, I'm sure you spoke about some websites. And uh, I think uh, when you share that information with Jyoti, Jyoti could then share it with all the participants. Uh, some sort of a website where uh, multiple uh, softwares for WebGIS will be available. There was also a question about licensing and the terms and conditions involved. But I think uh, that goes beyond the purview of this webinar. I think we can uh, share those websites which you uh, suggest to us and uh, to Nimla College and then they can be shared to the participants. And I think the participants should also spend some time in looking at the possible softwares which are available. Uh, the next question, uh, Arun, is that how to, uh, I mean, uh, there was another question on land use and land cover mapping, mm. which is uh, talking about, uh, just a second, let me scroll, scroll down. Yeah. It says, is there any advanced research in land use and land cover map creation? It's a generalized question, so you could answer it either uh, in terms of a proprietary software or an open source or web GIS. So anything on land um, use, land cover mapping? Yeah, yeah, land use, land cover mapping. So far, there is a classical approach. Uh, you know that the supervised and supervised classification that we normally do in the image processing. So people are not uh, now slightly moving away from those classical approach into um, like uh, deep planning methods. There are different different kind of a tools like uh, algorithms are like, available. Like SVM is there, K-means are there clustering, classification, there's n number uh, tree, decision trees are there. So if there, there is a, a shift, the way the images are getting processed and then outputs are getting uh, retrieved out of it. So yes, a lot of work is getting, is happening and people can actually look into some of the deep learning algorithms. My personal suggestion is to look into um, um, Google Colab, the fantastic tool. Uh, where you can actually integrate your tensor, TensorFlow, Keras, Python, and all uh, open source tools, and then even you, you can access your uh, the images uh, you want, so free images, and then you can apply your algorithm or a code over there in the cloud, and then get your output. So that is a, one of the best you can do without doing any investment. Anybody working on the land use land cover, you can spend your time. It's a worth doing it. You can. Tried. It's a Google collab.
Great, Arun. Thank you. Uh, just be around, Arun. Uh, and now I will move towards uh, Neeti uh, because yeah, uh, he presented it first. And I think uh, just be around. I think there will be some questions which uh, jointly any one of you can take. But let's first go towards uh, Neeti. Have a cup of coffee. I can see you are having coffee. <laughs> All the best. Neeti, are you there? Yes, I am here. Okay, Niti, good to have you back. Uh, yes. One one question that was uh, posed to you uh, was about just a second. Just bear with me. I'm trying to scroll up and down. And that question. Okay, and uh, the question was like, uh, how is SAR better than side-looking radar? Well, uh, it has its um, uh, merit because, uh, as I explained when I was presenting, the side-looking radar was close to the object, but it was having a limitation if you are looking for very fine detail and if you are uh, looking to cover a larger area, and side-looking radar requires a larger antenna because it is uh, uh, relative to that. So in that case, synthetic apparition radar helps you to monitor continuously over a larger area. For say, if you're looking at a deformation monitoring, if you're looking at a changes happen in topography, synthetic apparition radar would be beneficial because it monitors a larger area in the same setup and uh, it helps you to work, uh, uh, you know, even in, um, uh, what do you call, difficult weather conditions. Is it audible? Was it audible? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Just trying to uh, focus on another question for you, uh, Niti. Uh, yeah. The other question was on pathways. So there was a question about please focus on the important and useful pathways for future from a point yeah. of view of the student. Yeah, I think uh, uh, what I have, uh, uh, this question has emerged in between the presentation. I have given some pathways. Uh, where uh, let's say the, the next way to learn the technology is uh, as if you are a bachelor student, perhaps you need to take a master's course. The, the, uh, the better way we have is uh, there are diploma courses offered in the country, then there are master's courses offered in the country. Some courses are specific, let's say uh, it focus on remote sensing, some focus on all geospatial technologies. So a uh, student um, may take up these courses for higher learning on the subject. And uh, at times, um, uh, even after learning that, the, the curriculum itself would not be sufficient for a student to attain uh, the knowledge which industry required. So the continuous knowledge, as uh, uh, Arunji has said, so one would uh, need to focus where they wanted to work. Like after master's, definitely uh, at the end of a master, especially while doing projects, people can able to identify what specific area they want to focus. And uh, whatever area they focus, they can learn more about these days. We have so many open tools available in terms of software, in terms of study material also. We have so much of uh, um, resources available. So student can able to utilize this. And um, uh, that's, I think, the way the people can take it. And uh, if you if you can able to, if you wanted to go to industry, definitely there are a lot of scope after master's one can go to industry. And if you still want to pursue higher education, definitely there are a lot of ways to do that as well. So people can uh, continue in research environment and in R&Ds in industry with a JRF and other research positions, or people can still take up uh, higher studies and then move further uh, on the discipline. I think this is what a pathway I can uh, see from this technology. Great, I'm sure. I think, uh, and the uh, agenda for these webinar is also to look at different types of pathways which uh, you know individual students can take. I'm sure there are a lot of faculty members who are attending these webinars, and yeah. I'm sure that the whole idea is to kindle their imagination in some ways, and uh, they themselves will have to then uh, you know profess on a pathway and work on it. And alongside them, the students will follow. Uh, one of the questions, Niti, to you was, uh, why didn't you talk about SRTM? Well, SRTM is uh, an output of uh, uh, the synthetic operation radar. Let's say if I'm talking about optical system and if I'm uh, giving an example of Landsat, it is more similar to uh, this. SRTM is one of a product. Let's say you have uh, lesser images. You have different DTMs. SRM is one of the 
the digital elevation model that we have based on radar, topo radar topographic mission uh, from USGA. So that is one of the um, products. So I think we have touched on uh, the topographic mission, especially uh, we talked about synthetic aperture radar, so which uh, is an yield of, uh, uh, you know, SRTM is an yield of uh, synthetic aperture radar. So we touched that. So there are different DTM uh, available uh, in addition to SRTM, perhaps uh, for people who rely, still relies on uh, radar-based uh, aerial elevation models, SRTM could be the best. But if you're looking for an image-based, photogrammetry-based uh, DEMs, which are available, perhaps Aster DEM uh, would be available in a better resolution. Uh, and again, uh, um, uh, we do pro provide in India also, we do make uh, DEMs using Cartosat. So perhaps these three DTMs has been widely used uh, across the globe so far. Yeah, Niti, the next question, uh, thanks for that. Uh, Niti, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I'm hearing. Yeah. The next question was uh, how to produce and use a multi-resolution grid, a mixture of high and coarse uh, resolution of the same raster image in ArcGIS, GIS software. Uh, yeah, this is a general this, question in some ways. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to give uh, an answer to this along with an example as well. to a particular website or to answer it? Yeah, no, no, I, I'll give an, uh, a direct answer to that. In addition, I'll also like to give an example from one of our work uh, for this. Uh, let's say uh, when we are dealing with the multiple resolution, especially multiple spatial resolution, if you have one data set in a specific resolution, the other one is in uh, the different resolution, then the point of data fusion comes in. Uh, you know, we, we do that to begin in general remote set data processing, especially in digital image processing. We start that uh, by improving the quality of an image, the, the finer quality of uh, the finer image. Let's say an image with higher spatial resolution um, helps to improve the spatial resolution of a spectral image. Let's say in case of uh, the panchromatic images, in general, it has been talked with uh, better spatial resolution, where the multispectral images has uh, a relatively coarser spatial resolution. So people utilize uh, these two, uh, you know, the electro these two bands to improve a better image, which has higher spatial resolution and higher spectral resolution. That's the th uh, that, that is available in any textbook. That is what we used to do. Uh, but the concept of data fusion works even beyond that. So in one of the uh, project, what we have done, uh, we are having a coarser resolution imagery, which covers a very large portion uh, on the land surface, but uh, it, it temporal resolution is also higher. It visits, a, it visits a particular place almost every day, but it does not have a better spatial resolution though it have a better uh, spectral characteristics. So we used an image which has better spatial resolution and we fused both the images and we can able to generate image series where in which until certain date, the images with a coarser resolution can be improved with the help of an image with a better spectral resolution. So this is how the image fusion works. So we can able to merge two images and able to produce something better. So the tools for using that, uh, EDAS has some predefined tools and even NV has uh, predefined tools, but these are all, uh, uh, if you're looking for uh, more than one technique to do this, we can look for this commercial software. But if you look for an open source software, definitely uh, the plugins are available with QGIS and GRASS do have, uh, or Geodata do have, uh, Geodata do have some of these uh, tools for improving the, uh, spectral resolution and spatial resolution, especially after merging. Thanks, thanks, Niti. I think that was yeah. uh, quite elaborate. And I think uh, there's another question: Is there any possibility to get free Indian village shape files? This question was also posed in the last webinar. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, uh, <laughs> so yeah, the reason I was laughing is uh, in the last question I have provided a link to other participants uh, for getting the shape files. Uh, uh, we we do have certain places where we can get some information officially. Uh, the official place to get that probably data.gov.in. Uh, it is maintained by uh, the special NIDMS division of DST. So where you can get some official information there. But uh, the, there are a lot of open source in which the shape files are available. But the, the disclaimer for using those shape files are... Uh, uh, those are not uh, vetted, which means, uh, as the previous speaker said, you can use it, but 
you, you're not sure about the accuracy of it and uh, you know it is openly available especially if you use open street maps you get almost every shape file uh, that you needed though you may not get an attribute that you you are intended to use but you may get the the point line polygon files uh, from open street maps and other sources do exist uh, uh, some of the sources exist here but the authenticity is a big question for us it's a challenge so you can use it if you don't uh, want a precise and most accurate information because nobody vets these data sets Yeah, and I think that's an important uh, uh, point to be noted that uh, the vetting of the data sets, if it's not validated, then I think you have a potential uh, problem because or else you'll have to run with a disclaimer that these data sets are not verified or validated and these are being used for academic purposes or something of that kind. Uh, but thanks, Niti. I think that, that puts it in perspective. Uh, before we move to, uh, I mean, I just wanted to... To you know, get in some of our uh, other privileged uh, and uh, senior uh, members in the webinar as well. Uh, just any final parting words from you, uh, Niti? Uh, this is for. Uh, can you repeat the question again? No, I'm saying like uh, in terms of the presentation that you made in terms of remote sensing. Uh, yeah. Is there any final words that you would want to say? Uh, uh, I think um, um, you know um, when I look at the audience, we have uh, a wide variety of audience here, uh, starting from bachelor student till uh, uh, the very senior professors. Most of our gurus are there, who has actually inculcated uh, the idea of uh, geoinformatics, and especially a student like me who are coming from an interdisciplinary. Uh, I mean, coming from a different discipline altogether, uh, was literally attracted because of many of the teachers here. Uh, so. The student who takes a look at this presentation in a very short time by both of the speakers, I guess, uh, it's really difficult for them to grab everything. Uh, but there is always a potential. The idea is to just to uh, inculcate the subject so that if they inclined or in, towards a particular topic or if they wanted to know, they are, feel free to uh, contact us. And uh, the idea is to grow together and uh, uh, you know move ahead with the technology. And uh, what I can see is uh, uh, just one information which I uh, like to share. Uh, many of the disciplines has been affected due to COVID, but I feel the geospatial technology has got a new uh, blood because a lot of data sets has been generated. A lot of uh, industry requires to process it. I know many of them lost the job, but the, the kind of data set which I've generated in last three months is huge and they require new manpower once uh, the COVID gets over. I think uh, plenty of job opportunities do exist in the field. That's what I can uh, see the trend in some part of India. Thank you. Yeah, Niti, just one question uh, yeah. came up while you were uh, answering that. In terms of the difference between altimetry and LIDAR and why is altimetry being used largely for uh, sea level or bathymetric kind of a work? And then why is LIDAR being used more for terrestrial uh, application? Yeah, I think it would uh, more uh, depends on the wavelength that we have been utilizing and uh, uh, the capability of LIDAR to print it deep into the waters is uh, restricted and uh, where altimetry is a traditional uh, tool which has been used, uh, radar based technique can be used to penetrate deep into the waters and of course the LIDAR has been used widely in the shallow waters but not uh, in uh, the deep waters as far as I understood. Uh, but that's the reason and uh, LIDAR is an upcoming technique because uh, in terrestrial uh, way, we cannot say at the earlier stage we used to have balance and uh, say, you know the altimetry uh, using radar was pretty famous whereas currently the system depends on LIDAR because LIDAR does not only provides us the height which also provides us uh, the, the meticulous information that we have on the surface so uh, we can make use of that we can make use of multiple models the 3d models and we can uh, get more than one information rather compared to a classical altimetry technique in which we get only elevation thank you niti thank you, uh, thank you. arun uh, any final words from your side on webgis and related applications so through web we are connected that is the most important thing as uh, Nithya said a lot of data has been created that is true actually it is a, too much of data is getting created after this particular COVID uh, uh, thing happened especially the spatial data sets and people started realizing there is not enough data even from the uh, international level if you look at the World Bank or WHO there is no data after 2016, 17, 18. And how do you do the analysis of uh, data and then how do you find out the spread or 
what is the epidemic, how it is going to affect. So people have started working on getting a lot of data now. So WebJS is one of the important uh, tool actually to uh, source the spatial data sets. So it is, if it is rightly placed, the most effective tool may come from the GIS uh, to conquer the COVID-19, especially the spread uh, point of view. Uh, otherwise, uh, what I still believe is uh, like, uh, this is a very good uh, initiative done by Jyoti and especially you and uh, people who are participating. It is also work, uh, not only work from home, it is a learning from home, but unfortunately we work in the office and uh, thank you all of you. Thank you, Arun. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, there was just one more question as you were speaking about using QGIS in Corona analysis. Uh, anything that you would want to share on that? So QGIS, QGIS is open source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Q QGIS is a fantastic tool now. There is a Python plugin which is available and it can be directly linked with the Google Colab. That's the advantage. There is a Python code, TensorFlow, Keras, whatever it is, there is a plugins available, which can be uh, like external uh, deep learning tools or machine learning tools can be accessed. Not many people are explored it. There are people who in Bangalore, they are working on it from the Google team. And you can explore those options. So QJS is not far away in terms of uh, capabilities or doing the geoprocessing activities. Only the ESRI is having a better market share, but in terms of uh, performance, I think capabilities, QGIS is not for it. Thank you, Arun. Uh, that was really helpful. Uh, before uh, I move on to the other sections, I just wanted to invite uh, two more uh, August speakers, uh, I mean, August listeners and our uh, gurus, as Niti has said, who are there in the uh, audience. Uh, may I call uh, Sukumar sir uh, for his inputs? Sukumar sir, can you hear me? You need to unmute, sir. Yes, I could hear you. I could yes, hear sir. So your feedback and views, sir. Uh, it's a really nice thing that Jodhirbhai has organized this. The two people are nicely presented. What I felt was it has to reach the students because students are lacking any facilities. We should not talk high about many things. We have to come down to uh, grassroots level. We have to talk how to uh, I mean, uh, make them to take interest and then do it. Because when we talk high about it, they will not come very close to the subject at all. This is my feeling. Because I have gone for motivation classes and everything. If you are talking high about, they say, for example, Nityanandam said, SAR. If you say SAR, you will not understand. You have to say about SRTM. Then they will understand what is SRTM. That is why just the push close post. See, what I feel is we have to motivate the university students, geography students. That's my feeling. You have to come down because whenever you present something, it's a beautiful presentation. I know I have no uh, comments on that. But only thing you have to come down to lower level. That is, the people should take initiative because uh, we have to develop the interest in this remote sensing and DAS. That's what my feeling. For both of you, I I think so, sir. Uh, um, uh, just to Dr. Dipankar, shall I? Uh, um, yeah, yeah, please, please. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, uh, go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, we agree to that, uh, and uh, I mean uh, we have been uh, told to look at uh, the advanced technology, so we utilize the opportunity to showcase them. Some of them are available, and definitely next opportunity we like to give them the. The fundamentals and also the uh, the way to bring up uh, more interest to them. So we'll do that in future presentations. I mean, at least uh, I, I'll do that. Sir. Thank you. It's not the move. Thank you. Thank you, Niti. Uh, I think that was uh, well put by Sukumar sir. And I think uh, it's important that any technology or any discussion that we do uh, is available at the most you know uh, basic levels for people to understand. And that's I think how we actually create a pathway for uh, everybody to get interested in, into it and then walk on that path. Uh, so Sukumar, so thanks, thanks for that. May I now uh, call upon uh, Dr. Sridhar. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Sridhar, you are also one of the listeners and you post a couple of questions and uh, I would just like to get your feedback, sir. Yeah, sure. Definitely. I think I should congratulate both the speakers. 
first of all at uh, dr arun and dr nityananda has done good work on the scope of uh, gis and the application of lidar radar and so on and so forth but i think there should be a word about quantum gis which is upcoming in corona analysis so i think that should be the target now because many of in especially if it take tamil nadu i am a retired hydrogeologist from uh, tamil nadu water supply drainage board and i am interested in both the topics especially in the lidar radar and remote sensing gis and uh, especially quantum gis so my, some of my colleagues are working on quantum gis with respect to some districts in tamil nadu for corona analysis that is why i just raised that question to dr arun kumar in fact that is why see there are lot of things that is coming out of this corona lot of data has been produced and with this i think we can at least do some trend analysis such that that the future generations will be of much helpful to this top of uh, topics thank you very much thank you dipankar thank you sir actually uh, i am hearing your voice after very long time yeah i don't know whether you remember me but i remember you i remember you doctor yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much sir and then point taken yes. yeah yeah i think uh, we should also thank uh, jyoti for bringing us all together after so long i mean uh, it's been such a long time to hear and uh, you know listen to all the great people that we have uh, learned and i'm sure all the listeners the young students who are there in this uh, group because after 40 i think we can call the students young now and uh, i think there is a lot of learning curve that uh, comes along and i think uh, corona definitely has also as arun said given us time to you know uh, you know learn from home so uh, i thank everybody uh, let me hand it over now to uh, dr jyotin mai for the next uh, actions thank you Uh, thank you dipanka Th- thank you all the speakers and uh, all my gurus uh, i would like to thank everybody for uh, actively participating in the question answer session also uh, so one more thing i want to make it uh, clear that uh, uh, when i told arun and uh, nityanandam uh, don't be so basic level in your uh, ppt presentation i i only told that because Uh, students are not aware of what are the opportunities uh, in higher studies or when they go for a job what are the things they have to do or they have to learn they don't have any idea and even the faculty members are also handicapped it is uh, uh, i'm openly telling this also so uh, i think people should hear from you people uh, like uh, uh, what is the scenario right now Mm, so that is why i asked them i requested them to be little advanced uh, level not uh, the base just the basics uh so uh, i hope all of you all the students and the staff members also got an exposure so thanks a lot uh, for all the a uh, uh, lot of uh, um, hard work behind this uh, preparation i i, I hope uh, nityanandam took one night full to prepare his uh, ppt thanks a lot <laughs> thanks a lot for uh, both of you now i would like to call upon uh, sister helen assistant professor department of geography for a uh, um, uh vote of thanks sister are you there yes yes ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am can you hear me ma'am audible you are audible you are audible yes yes ma'am good evening to all first and foremost i extend my most sincere thanks to the almighty god for making today's event a resounding success it is blessing and grace gratitude is the fairest blossom which springs from the soul it is my great privilege to thank our distinguished speaker dr y nityanandam assistant professor department of natural resources tri school of advanced studies new delhi and i also thank our eminent speaker mr arun kumar nandagopal gis app developer center of spatial analytics and advanced gis national institute of advanced studies Indian Institute of Science Bangalore Thank you sir we are all inspired by your talk and we express our sincere thanks for giving an excellent coverage on future pathways in geoinformatics remote sensing and web gis we are all really enlightened with your knowledge on remote sensing and web gis surely your session was beneficial to all the participants thank you so much for sharing your thoughts views and clarification I would like to propose hearty word of thanks to our doc- moderator, Dr. Tibanko, for gracing today's webinar. 
now with immense gratitude i thank our management secretary principal vice principal for their encouragement guidance and constant support i record my deep appreciation of thanks to the head of the department the organizer and coordinators of this program for their dedicated works their involvement and willingness to take over the program the event wouldn't have been successful with the participants i thank all the participants for paying your valuable attention and your active participation once again i thank all for your cordial cooperation thank you to all thank you sister thanks a lot so uh, i would uh, like to thank once again uh, all the speakers thank you uh, everybody all the participants for uh, silent listening also they should also be congratulated uh, we had a very wonderful session without much disturbances